Hi all, so I'm here today to talk to you about um, how to build a unified API. Um, so just a bit of audience participation to start with. Um, how many people can raise their hands and say you're a back-end developer or a systems architect or software engineer? Great, so there's quite a few of you here. Um, my talk today should cater for you, but it should also cater for those front-end developers in the audience and also more business-type people. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been coding since the days of the BBC Micro, back in the middle of the sort of 1980s, um, and got really fired up about tech then. Um, as Ian introduced me, I've been sort of doing various development roles over the years, but um, now I'm sort of more of a technical manager, and I work at a great place called Holiday Extras. Now, to give you a bit of background about what we do at Holiday Extras, which will help lay the landscape for sort of why I'm talking about APIs today. So I work for two parts of Holiday Extras. Uh, the first part is Short Breaks, where we work with most of the sort of UK's theme parks. And for them, we uh, package their ticket stock with hotel stock that we manage and bring that back together through an API and provide e-commerce platforms. We also run Show and Stay, London's uh, biggest um, short breaks destination for theatre packages in, in London. And with these sites, we've been doing sort of 40 million bookings over the last, uh, 40 million visits over the last five years, half a million bookings, and on average in a year, we can give about 20 million pounds worth of revenue to hotel suppliers. Now, there's another part to my role as well. I work with a startup called MyDrive, and we've been going for a bit over a year now and we're building a mobile app to help people to learn to drive easier. So looking at the pupil side of things. And my involvement with this has also given me a deep and insightful knowledge of APIs. So I'm not going to tell you what an API is. I expect most of the audience already knows about APIs and knows what they can do. But I think they're amazing things. Um, I think APIs are really cool. And because of APIs, I know that I walked just over 6,000 steps yesterday because I wear a Fitbit. Um, I know that I like to listen to a lot of Radiohead, the temperature in New York, and I can very quickly get the um, longitude and latitude of the location here. So with, with the, all these open APIs, we can do some amazing things. Now, I come to a few conferences, and quite often we get told the future is mobile, or the future is social, or the future is cloud. Now, I'm not going to deny that these things are in the future of the web. Um, if anything, I think these things are very much now. I think now we're already having to deal with mobile, we're having to deal with social, and we're having to deal with cloud. Um, but for me, the future really is about APIs. Okay? APIs, I think, are the biggest thing in the landscape of the future of the web. Um, and I think APIs are what underpin those three models. I don't think we would have social without APIs. Many of us use Twitter clients to do tweeting. Uh, all which interface with Twitter's API. Twitter sort of talk about over 90% of tweets are done through the API um, rather than the web client. Uh, Amazon wouldn't have been so popular with their cloud computing platform if it wasn't for having a great API. And mobile apps, many of which interface with backends that expose APIs. So a little bit about what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to go over the problems we had at Holiday Extras. Um, and explain those to you. I'm going to then go over the solutions, both good and bad, that we came up with to solve the problems. I'm going to um, give you some considerations when working with APIs, talk about the technologies that we used, um, and then tell you how you can do this too. So I'm going to start with the problem. We had a number of problems at Holiday Extras. Going back about seven years, we had um, quite a large web dev stack that worked in a very sort of traditional way, lots of PHP, um, no APIs at the time. And a new problem that came along is that we needed to deal with multiple sources of data. So the easiest way for me to explain this is we had our own back-end reservation system. We pulled this stock into our application layer, and then we presented it out to the web. But we were being approached by many of our suppliers to interface directly with their systems. So we had our own stock, and now they wanted us to go and talk to their own systems. And this was a real problem for us. To explain this in a bit more context, Google have had this same problem. So if you type in a search for a film, or an actor, or an actress, or a country into Google, on the left-hand side here, you'd get the normal natural listings. And then on the right-hand side, you get the Google knowledge base. 
And if you look carefully, you can see that the Google Knowledge Base, when I type in a film, sources information from IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, Wikipedia. And Google have documented about their knowledge graph. They've explained that they interface with all these partners like the CIA, uh, CIA World Factbook and Wikipedia to source this information. So they're consuming many different sources of data, consuming many people's, um, other people's APIs and presenting it back out through their own. Now, as well as having to consume multiple sources of data, we needed to um, deal with multiple consumers of our data. So we're moving into an era that's very mobile, as I said before, and we're getting to a state where, as I explained with Twitter, you have multiple clients written by different people, as well as their own clients, mobile apps, web interfaces, all needing to source information from the same place. So in our short breaks business, over the last 18 years, we've seen a decline in desktop traffic and a rise in mobile. Mobile is over 40% now. And probably towards the beginning of next year, we'll see mobile and tablet usage added together, overtaking desktop use. So as I explained before, I work with a startup called MyDrive. And we've got this problem in our situation there. So we've got a native mobile app that needs to source information and a web app that needs to source the same information but we only want to put this information in one place. We only want to put this business logic in one place. Now, another problem we had was trying to sort of decouple. As I said before, we had a very large PHP stack where um, it was a single code base that did absolutely everything. It was a sort of Swiss army knife where everything we did was in one application, um, and we wanted to decouple things off so that we could reuse components more. The biggest problem we had is that we wanted to hide legacy. So um, can anyone give me a raise of hands in the audience? Who's got legacy systems they don't want to interface with? They don't want to deal with this stuff. Um, they would rather their developers had less pain. We all have this problem. And uh, I think when I come onto the solutions later, I've found a, well, me and my team have found a great solution to this problem. Speed. So over the talks in the last couple of days, a lot of people would have talked to you about speed. They have talked about how to speed up websites using things like Chrome Developer Tools. Now, we have speed issues. We had speed issues at Holiday Extras with our solutions. And we've done a lot of the front end speed optimization, so less HTTP requests and optimizing images. But we still had speed issues. Being an e-commerce platform, we have to go and get prices for products. And this can be very slow. So we found that a lot of our speed issues were actually in our back-end architecture. Once we'd sped up the front-end, we still had a lot of issues at the back-end. And as has already been included in some other people's slides the last few days, you know, Amazon had done some work back in sort of 2006 where if they increased their page load by 100 milliseconds, then there was a 1% reduction in revenue. And Mozilla had also done some experiments back in 2010 where um, for every well, they cut two and a half seconds off the um, Firefox download page and saw 60 million more browser downloads that year. So speed is a really, really big thing in the web right now. Scalability was a big issue for us. About three years ago, we picked up all our technical architecture and we moved it into the cloud. And we thought that would solve our scalability issues. But our software, our architecture wasn't really written for the cloud and our software and architecture wasn't really scalable. So we'd scaled our hardware, but we still had a software scaling issue. And most of all, we wanted to be more efficient with our resource. So as Addy mentioned yesterday, and mentioned in the talk before lunch, you know, we've got all these tools like Grunt that can optimize our workflow and be more efficient with our developers. But because we were working on legacy platforms, a lot of our developers, they were wasting a lot of time working with legacy um, formats and legacy systems. And this was an inefficient way of us sort of using our wage bill on our developers who were spending a lot of time doing the work that we didn't want them doing when we wanted them innovating on new technology. So what is the solution to this? Now, this is where I'm going to come on to the unified bit and explain why I call this a unified API. But before I do that, I want to talk, you down, uh, talk to you through the first solution we went through. So, as I said before, about seven years ago, we had a web stack that looked like this. So we had a front-end website interfaced with a massive PHP application layer, 
and that talked to a legacy reservation system. So this reservation system start, um, holds availability on certain dates for hotels and prices for hotels and presents that stock over XML back up to the web application layer. Now we took this and over time we had um, third parties that wanted to interface with us. So at Holiday Extras we have some of the largest stock of um, short breaks packages and we do a lot with airport hotels as well and airport car parking. And so we had um, affiliates that wanted to have access to our product. So we took our web application layer written in PHP and we exposed it as an API. We just rewrote parts of it to try and expose an API and we still talk to our legacy reservation system. And then, as I said before, we needed to consume multiple sources of data. So we had some hotel suppliers approach us and say, why can't you come and get the stock out of our systems? So we're like, OK, what can we do here? So we went and wrote a massive Java application and stuck that behind our legacy reservation system. And our legacy reservation system at this time wasn't maintained by us. It was maintained by a third party group of developers written in a code base that was about 20 years old. And we did the same with the ticketing system, wrote a big Java application. And then behind this Java application, we went and interfaced with third parties. So we now had a legacy reservation system that we didn't maintain or look after. Um, we got that to talk to a massive Java application. We had a massive PHP application on the front with a cobbled together API. And then we started slotting more systems behind the hotel system. So if you take one thing home today, do not do this. This is really important. This is bad architecture. Um, this was a big failure on our part, and we learned a lot on this journey, which is why we got to the final solution I'm going to talk you through. So when we realized that wasn't the best of things, we started scribbling. And developers like to scribble lots. Um, if anyone's ever seen any of my scribbles, they're completely intangible, but I like to draw a lot of boxes. And we drew something like this. So we have multiple consumers on the front end, consumers that we might not even know about yet, like emerging smart televisions, etc. And on the back end, we've got multiple suppliers of data. And in the middle, we've got this lovely box, which at the time we didn't call a unified API, but we drew it there. We didn't know what it was called, and we realized that was the solution to everything. Now, as we went through building this unified API, there's many components to the solution. And the first one I want to talk to you about is how we used it as a proxy. So, as we saw before, many of you want to hide legacy systems. And we had this same problem. We didn't want to interface with our legacy systems over XML. So we used our API as a proxy. So back to our earlier example, we've got a website with a web application layer and a legacy reservation system. And we slotted in our unified API. So at this moment in time, all the functions of the reservations of hotels is still done in a legacy reservation system, and nothing's being done in our new system. And then in our unified API, we say, well, actually, now go and get the availability of prices for hotels from our new system. And we wrote that in here. We're still making bookings over here in our legacy system, but we've just peeled one function off and sent it through to a new code base. We're still doing 20 or 30 functions on the left-hand side here. And over time, we can just start peeling functions off one by one and moving them into our new system. Also, at this time, our, our unified API, our proxy, is exposing JSON now further up to the application layer. So we've hidden away XML and SOAP down here, and we're now using newer technologies that we want to move towards. We then moved on to trying to make it hierarchical. So I talked earlier about scaling issues we had when we moved to the cloud, and um, we realized the way of solving this was to make our software stack hierarchical. So. In this example of our proxy, we had our legacy reservation system and our new system. These two systems are providing the same function, or we're moving functions across. But we could also use it to talk to two systems with a different function. So any of you familiar with sort of relational databases, you might go into one table, get some information, and then join it to another table. Well, we were doing that sort of MySQL join in our unified API. So I could come in, I could get some hotel product with the prices out of our product API, I could then join the product that came back to our content API and present information about those hotels. And then I can mash that all together in our unified API and push it back up the stack. So that's great. And now my product API becomes a unified API. This becomes a proxy. And proxies to hotels and tickets and transport APIs. And then I can go one step further 
and I can now put our legacy reservation system and our new system and any possible affiliates that want to present hotel stock to us further down. So each one of these layers is just another unified API written in whatever language is appropriate. And hierarchically, I can stack these systems. Now, around this time, I was lucky enough to meet a guy called Fred George, who talks a lot about microservices architecture. Now, he's got some great ideas on this and um, presents about the concept of building lots of small systems that do a single function. So we move away from our traditional enterprise architecture, a Swiss army knife that does everything with a million line code base, and we move to writing tens or twenties or hundreds of systems that have about a thousand lines of code in or less. So we only write a single system to perform a single function. Now we liked this idea, this was a great idea, but we thought that this microservices architecture was a bit disorganized. We couldn't see how we could get the systems to talk to one another. So we merged a lot of Fred George's ideas on microservices architecture with our own hierarchical architecture views and ended up with a diagram a bit like this. Along came authentication. So as I said before, we've got multiple consumers of our API. We need to authenticate these people. So how are we going to go about doing this? So we scratched our heads and went away and realized that Back to my earlier diagram again, with our unified API, we can implement authentication once. So if I've got hundreds of APIs further down this stack, I don't need to implement authentication more than once. I can do it once in our unified API. And once I've authenticated the consumer of our API, I can pass on their authentication details further down the stack. So I can pass on auth tokens and roles and allow the other systems to decide what level of access you should have. So this was a big win for us. And then we came to sort of standardizing payloads. So when you're consuming multiple APIs, you're going to find lots of issues where some of them return you XML, and some of them return you JSON, and some of them involve SOAP. You'll also hit a lot of formatting issues. So one of my favorite XKCDs is that, you know, why do we use so many different date formats? This, this problem was solved in the 80s. There's an ISO date standard. Why don't we all use it? And there's ISO standards for pretty much everything, country codes, currency codes, dates. And I know that Rob Hawkes talked yesterday about, with his Viz Cities um, project, that he'd found it hard dealing with multiple data formats. If you build a unified API, you can present out a single format. So in our unified API, we chose JSON, we sat at a whiteboard, and we ignored all the systems we consumed and we drew what we thought a hotel model should look like. So it should have a hotel name, a star rating, a price, um, what the room type is. And we modeled up what this JSON payload looked like. Then when we talked to other hotel systems, we didn't care what they returned us. We cleaned it up and pushed it back into our standardized model. So if you called our unified API, and we brought back hotels from one provider and another provider, as a consumer of our API, you didn't really need to worry about that. The hotel models we returned you in an array out of our unified API were standard and consistent, um, regardless of what the further down providers required. Now, as we started returning JSON payloads, we realized that the web was going very much to sort of client-side web applications. So lots of people are using tools like Backbone and writing client-side applications to consume their APIs. And the problem here is that when you return a JSON payload, um, good developers like us can open up the Chrome DevTools and start hacking the JSON that comes back. And we'd built a booking platform whereby when you do an availability request and you get back a list of hotels with prices, in order to book one of those hotels, you pass that JSON object back in on the book request. So if that can now be modified, someone can change the price or change other parts. So for each object within our collections that we returned, we checksummed them. So you'd get a list of hotels, maybe 20 hotels, and each object would be started with a checksum. We sort of copied the idea that any one of you that sort of downloaded um, ISOs of Linux distributions years ago from SourceForge and places like that, they presented a checksum on the site, and it allowed you to validate that the payload of data was, was safe. So we put these checksums in, and when you pass the payload of data back to us for booking, we check the checksum against the model, and if it matches, things are good, and if it doesn't, we know things are bad. 
Now, we still check things further down. So when we get to our own reservation system, we still check the price is actually what you said, because you might have worked out our checksum algorithm and sort of still faked things that way. But this was a way of very early on in code being able to, within a few lines, very quickly check if the data being given to us is valid or is dirty in some way and has been manipulated. Now, the biggest win for us with building a unified API was dealing with our speed issues. So we knew that we could do this with caching and asynchronous requests, but we had to sort of think about how we were going to go and do this. Now, we had a reservation system where if you made an availability request before we built this unified API, it could take three or four seconds. You know, we'd go and get a hotel, and then after we'd brought the hotel back into the PHP layer, we'd go and request some tickets, and then after those came back, we'd go and request some transport, and all of these things were running one after the other, consuming a lot of time. So we started doing our requests asynchronously. When we hit our unified API and said, I want a short break to Legoland in the UK, we would go and get some hotels, we would go and get the ticket prices simultaneously, go and get transport, food, you know, and the possibilities are endless. And instead of a request like this traditionally taking sort of 3.7 seconds, we were now down to it being as slow as the slowest provider of stock, which in this case is 1.2 seconds from the hotels. So I've axed 60% of my load time from getting product availability data just by asynchronously running my requests. You know, the savings there are far bigger than any savings we could possibly have made on the front end. But that still wasn't good enough for us. So 1.2 seconds is still too slow. It's too slow to return product to the customer. So we cached. And uh, anyone that's known anything about caching, you should cache as close to the customer as possible. Try and cache as far up the stack as possible. So the first thing we did is we built a cache on the front of our unified API. So when you come in and you say, I want a hotel for next Saturday and Legoland tickets, we take the JSON request you make, we hash it up, we go into Redis, and we see if it's in there, and if it's not, then we go and make the individual requests. Once all of that comes back, just before we return the payload out the door, we stick it in a Redis cache. When the second customer comes in and asks for exactly the same request, we hit our Redis cache, 0.04 seconds. 0.04 seconds to return a payload of data back out of our API from 1.2 before and 3.7 before that. So the benefits were massive here. But as I said before, we sort of package products, so we package data. So sometimes a part or a component might have been um, the same as another customer looked for, but the actual whole response wasn't the same. So we then went on to cache the individual components that made it up, so that if you searched for um, a, a break next weekend and you were looking for a double room, we'd come up and we'd cache that. When the next person comes on and looks for a single room, the hotel part isn't relevant. So it'd miss the top cache, but the ticket part's the same. So we'd pull it out of the ticket cache and then do an individual hotel request. So in summary, we had problems with multiple data sources, which we solved by building a unified API. We had multiple consumers of our data, which we solved by building standardized payloads. Um, we wanted to decouple, so we looked at microservices architecture. We wanted to hide legacy, so we used proxies to do that. We wanted to speed things up, which we did with caching and asynchronous, and we solved our scalability with hierarchical architecture. Now, those were our solutions, but while we were building that, there were some considerations that came along. So, if you're going to build an API, there's a real big question about whether it should be open or commercial. So, there's many open APIs out there, like the Yahoo API and the Google APIs, and they have large user bases and make those companies well-known and popular. But we're in a business where we need to make money, so we need our API to sell product, and it's that product that makes the money that keeps the business going. So we've got a commercial API, and most people will tell you that you need to have one or the other. But I think that there's another way. I think you can have commercial and open elements to your API. I think that you can expose some parts of your API, like we might expose our product information, um, as an open API, but we might expose the commercial part that when you make a booking on our platform, we keep a percentage of the profits as well as the person consuming it. I think that you can have a mixed approach and that you can get popularity through having the open parts of your API while getting the revenue streams that need to keep your business running through the commercial side. And if you're going to build an open API, then one of the first things that comes along is the right way to rate limit. 
So if you build an open API, it gets popular. The first thing that's going to happen is going to appear like a denial of service attack when a million developers out there start consuming your API. So what you'll find all the large sort of companies have provided, like the Twitter API and the Google API, is they've rate limited you. If you want to call the Geo API in Google, you can do 1,000 or so requests a day, and then you're not allowed to do any more. Or you can buy for larger access. Now, if you start putting rate limiting into your API, you're going to find that it actually causes you a scaling issue. So if you go into a database and say, right, this person's authenticated, they're Fred, right, I'm going to go into the database, increment their counter for accessing today by one, check if their counter's gone over the limit and come back out, you're now doing a database write and read every single call that comes to your API. And these database calls are very expensive. So a neat approach to this is just increment the counters in the database for usage, but don't check people against their rate limit. So don't read the database and see if they're against their rate limit. Instead, do that task overnight in batch. Send a friendly email to anyone that's gone over their rate limit and warn them and just say, please don't do that again. And you can do a sort of three strikes approach where you could put somebody on a sort of one strikes list, put them on a two strikes list, and then when they hit that three strikes list, you can then check live every time they make a request if they've gone over their rate limit. So now you're only checking probably 1% or 2% of your API consumers real time to see if they've gone over their rate limit, which is cheaper on your database, and you trust everybody else not to uh, cheat the system. So the other advantage about open APIs is it gives you unlimited pools of talent. Now, Chris Jason, who's the API director of ESPN, spoke about this on Mashery a little while ago. And he said that when ESPN built their API, they had about 16 developers internally working on their API. But when they opened it up, within a few months, they had about 50 partners, each with their own development teams. So they moved from 16 developers working against their API to hundreds of developers. And these hundreds of developers weren't on their payroll. So they had people building applications for like the Microsoft Surface or like Samsung building software for their smart television. They had an unlimited pool of talent that wasn't on their payroll that was putting ESPN in front of the customer. What greater way than to get your business out there? Now, another consideration when you're uh, building these APIs is that sooner or later something's going to go wrong. And when that happens, you need to debug things. Now, we thought about this up front, and we pushed all our data into Logly. So Logly is a cloud-based logging solution. We push every single request that comes into and out of our API into Logly. And from there, we can debug things. So I can do a search on a customer's postcode, and I can see the booking requests that came through the API. And we actually use a session ID. So when someone starts working with our API, we issue them a session. So from a booking, we can backtrace the session ID, and we can actually see all the availability requests they did. Um, I can pretty much replay all the activity they did on our, our API. Now, this logging causes problems. I mean, we, we create about three gigabytes of JSON logs a day on our API, which is about 30,000 unique payloads of data getting logged. Um, but they can easily be a lot larger than this. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the technology we used when we were building our APIs. So we're big fans of Node at Holiday Extras. We've been using Node for about two and a half years now, um, since the early days. Node.js is awesome for building these um, unified APIs. The asynchronous nature, the callback nature of JavaScript is, is just perfect for this stuff. Um, also, as was mentioned yesterday in some of the real-time talks, is it's very easy to do things like Socket.io if you want to do that. We built on the Express framework. As I said when I was talking about caching, we use Redis. Um, we host all this stuff in Amazon Cloud. So being a travel business, we have a lot of um, seasonal variants. So in the summer, we might have you know, half a dozen boxes in the Amazon cloud. And in the winter, we can scale back down to a couple and do all this scaling automatically. Um, you can also do the same in daytime and overnight as we get you know, time zone variances. And we use Logly for our cloud-based logging. So keep it simple if you're going to build a unified API. You know, these standards on the left are going out of favor. People don't use SOAP anymore. XML's dying off. You know, build a RESTful API. Use Hatos and do JSON. Stick to the standards that are emerging. Um, it will help if you want more people to consume your API. As I said before, with people doing things with mobile apps and smart televisions and client-side web applications written in Backbone, Angular, Ember, all of these things are very easy to write um, applications that consume JSON. 
So cloud-based log uh, logging rocks. It's absolutely amazing. As I said before, we're logging sort of three gigabytes of JSON data a day. And within a few seconds, I can search for a customer's postcode or surname. And I can backtrack through this and see it. So there's many people doing this right now. We happen to use Logly, but there's some great solutions out there like Sumo Logic and Logstash. Um, go away, look up some of these technologies, and put them into your business process. Many of these logging solutions not only will allow you to log from software, but you can pump things like your Apache logs or your PHP logs or MySQL logs into them. You know, sticking an Apache log into a text file on disk at one gigabyte a day is useless. You can't search the thing. You can't find out what's going wrong. But if you push that log into one of these services, you can find out how many 404 errors you had served by Apache yesterday versus today. So cloud-based logging is absolutely awesome. Now, although I told you what we're using, um, language doesn't really matter. Um, it doesn't really matter what language you choose to use. You can build these APIs in anything. You don't have to use Node.js. And actually, language gives you a lot of flexibility. So when I talked about hierarchical parts of the API earlier, the great thing is, is with a microservices architecture, you're actually writing software to do one function. So if there's a particular language that's good for that function, you can use that language. If you've then got a different function and there's a better language for that, you can use a completely different language there. So you, know, you might go and build the next Twitter or something. And if you want to do the search part of their API, that might require a certain type of technology. So no SQL solutions and a language that's good for that. But when someone goes to look up a person in Twitter to see how many followers they've got, the people part of their API, that might be better in a different language and using different database technologies. So you can go through picking the appropriate language for your microservice, coupling it with the right data store. If you want to access the data that a service owns, you talk to the service API. No services cross-talk to one another's databases. And then you can use any language you want. So you like what I've said, and you think you want to re-implement this yourselves. So where can you start in your businesses? So one of the best places to start is what do you hate? When you go back to the office or you go back to your workplace, what do you hate at the moment? Do you hate the legacy system you interface with? Do you hate that you have to deal with SOAP? Um, do you hate that you find it really hard to mash up APIs client side using jQuery Ajax or Backbone? Find out the thing that you hate the most and bake that into your first version of Unified API. You know, building something like the proxy I explained earlier could be as simple as sort of 16 or 18 lines of Node.js. So you could build something within a few minutes and start implementing it straight away. Where are you going as a business? So what do you want to do? What's the challenges that are on the horizon? And could this sort of technology and this sort of architecture allow you to solve those? Think about which public APIs you can leverage. So as I said before, there's, you know, if you're going to do something in the geo space, talk to Twitter's geo API. If you want to pull in the weather, so in our MyDrive application, we display the weather to the, both the mobile app and to the website. And instead of getting our mobile app to talk to Yahoo's weather API and then getting our website to, we've actually talked to our unified API, which talks to Yahoo's weather API. So the big advantage here is that if we move away from Yahoo's weather API, we can just do it in our unified API. We don't need to update our mobile app. We don't need to roll a new version of the mobile app. You know, we've decoupled all our consumers by hiding it all behind our proxied unified API. If you build this thing and it's got some value, there's going to be people wanting to use it. So if you build a great open API, or you're in a commercial business where people want access to your product, then people are going to need access. So think up front about who they might be, work with them, think about authentication, and think about when they're going to be calling your API and how it's going to have to scale. Good documentation. So there's a great um, pusher blog post that I'll share afterwards that talks about getting the developer experience right. If you're going to build an API for people to consume, there's the right way to document it. You know, there's been lots of talk in recent years about well-documented and badly documented APIs. There's been a lot of people that have gone out there to do a lot of work about getting the API experience right. Yesterday, I know that um, the guys from PayPal talked about how they've reinvented their developer.paypal.com, and it is a lot, lot better now. Um, us developers like good documentation. We like to be able to do download code examples and be able to get something consuming an API instantly. So if you plan on exposing your API, baking good documentation. 
So that just leaves me with some takeaways for you. Consume your own APIs, so eat your own dog food. I love the fact that GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub. You know, Atlassian used Jira to build Jira, and there's many more examples of this. Um, in Eamon's talk first thing this morning, he said talk about solving problems that you have. So build APIs for your internal team to consume. Build APIs that you want to use, and then worry about other people using them later. So solve your own problems first with APIs. And then Steve Yegi, this is a great quote from him, that you wouldn't really think of an online bookstore needs to be an extensible, programmable platform, would you? And yet Amazon went on to uh, build the sort of cloud computing that is AWS. So this comes from Steve's um, Google platform rant that he posted in 2011, where he talked about sort of spending six years at um, six years at Amazon and then six years at Google, and he compared the experience at them both. And in that, he talks about a time where the, the top guys at Amazon came down one day and said, what we're going to do is each individual team is going to expose what they do via an API. The only way teams are going to interact is by APIs. You can only talk by APIs. You'll expose documentation about your APIs. And that's the way all the sub-teams in Amazon need to work. Now go and make it happen. And this actually happened. This happened back in the sort of mid-2000s. And Amazon went and did that. So now when you've got a developer community at Amazon that are consuming the IT services that are being provided by the IT department, and they're exposing those via an API, it's very, very easy for Amazon just to switch that externally facing, and hey, presto, we've got cloud computing. So I believe the future of web apps is unified APIs. I believe that if you architect and code a really well-written API, that it can take your business to the next level. I believe it's the underpinning for everything in the web. It's the underpinning for where we're going with mobile, social, and cloud. And that's the end of my talk. So we're hiring at the moment. Um, also, um, my speaker notes will be up in a few minutes on bit.ly forward slash unified API, as well as all my footnotes from my talk. If you have any questions, then hook me up on Twitter. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>